getting your blueprints to get access to some of the point information and the model information that you're spawning with BCG can be very powerful. I'm going to show you a few methods of utilizing this power, and then I'm going to show you how to set it up for yourself. So here I have a BCG graph that's spawning the cubes and the pyramids, but these lights are appearing above them without the help of the graph. As you can see, and it's only appearing on about half of them and only above the cubes. This is the graph for this actual blueprint. It is just getting the spline data, it is sampling the points, it's doing a simple density filter, and then it's doing a static mesh spawner, in this case with two inputs here, one with a cube and one with a pyramid. And this is kind of going to be the same setup for most of the stuff here with a few little tweaks. But in this version, we're using it to spawn the lights above them and only half of the time. There's another use case for potentially getting these points. Up here in the top left corner, you can see we have these cones. And if I move them to the right, well, they're pyramids. If they move them down, the pyramids become colored pink. And if I move them left here, the cones are now pink. So without actually changing the mesh on this, we can actually change the material, etc., by using blueprints. And this is the same similar setup in the PCG node. The only difference is in here, I actually don't even have the second input. I have a cube in here. So I'm not even actually using the cube at all, because as you can see here, we're using cones and pyramids. That is the final result. We're only using the cube as kind of the reference point, and then we're entirely replacing it with something else. And the last example I want to show is this guy here. Now, this might seem like a simple setup. In fact, if I go to the PCG graph, again, it is the same thing, just a density filter with a single cube mesh spawning here. Nothing else. That's all it is. But for this one, if I hit simulate, well, half of them are actually going to start moving up and down like so. And it's completely random. So if I go ahead and just move this over and then generate a new one, as you can see with PCG, half of those will move up and down. And this is all done through accessing the point information and what it is through the blueprint. So let me show you how it's all set up. Now for this tutorial, I'm going to assume that you already have turned on PCG and you have some kind of blueprint to spawn it with your PCG graph plugged in and whether you're using a spline or anything else won't actually affect it. In my case, I am using a spline to spawn this. In the graph itself, all I'm doing as before is I'm getting my spline information, I'm sampling it, and then I'm culling out 70% of the points, and then I'm spawning a simple cube here. Now, this can be done, of course, with any number of things, but the main thing to keep in mind is the actual blueprint gets the information after the generation has completed based on what it has access to. So if you want to gain access to the points here at this point and then do something else, you wouldn't be able to do that quite as easily. You only have information, basically, if I bring this blueprint into the level, you get information from the instances that are created in here. And if you use like blueprint actors and spawn them in general, and so they're not children of here, that's fine too. You can then use another method to gain access and modify those. So once your blueprint actor is created in here in the PCG graph, we're going to want to create a new function. And this function is going to be run after the PCG is finished compiling. Now you can call it whatever you want. I'll just call it post PCG construction. And then I'm going to take this name and I'm going to copy it because we actually need access to this exact name spelled exactly the same. So if I click PCG here and their components on the right under properties, it has the activate option, but below that is advanced. If you open it up, you get access to a few interesting features. One of them is post generate function names. This basically runs functions after finishes generate. It have many of these. They don't all have to be one. You can have as many as you want, but we'll go ahead and add this one. So I'll go ahead and press plus. I'll add index here and I'll put in this name ex spelled exactly the same. Now there's two other things we're going to need. And in here, in this actual function, we need to make it call an editor or it won't run. We're going to give it a specific variable and that is going to be a PCG data collection. So go ahead and select that as its actual input. And you can call this whatever you want. It doesn't actually matter. So I'll call it PCG data. We don't actually need this to actually do anything with it but it is needed for this to run. So if I come here and just do print string and compile, you can see it has run. So if I come here and then I just move this over, you can see it is printing hello. So it is now executing this graph. If you guys are enjoying the tutorial so far, I would love if you hit the like button. And while you're down there, consider subscribing if you haven't already. We now can get access to everything it creates. So for example, we can get components by class. Now they're of type instant static mesh. So now we have access to all of those and we can do a simple for each loop. So now what we can do is grab all the actual 
unique objects. So in our case, we have just a cube. And then we can get the instance count, which is the total amount of instances of that cube in the entire area, and then subtract one, and then do a for loop. So regular for loop with that minus one being the last index. So now we have access to effectively every single one of those cubes. Let's say we want to spawn an additional cube, a couple of units above it, but let's say half of the time, 20% of the time, whatever it is, we can go ahead and here we'll get ourselves a random integer in range and then go from one to 100. And if this is less or equal to 25, so it's a 25% chance, then we'll continue on. So go through all the cubes, find ones that succeed in this 25% chance. And from here, we can go ahead and add another static mesh component. And it's just gonna be a subcomponent. The relative transform, we can go ahead and split this. So we're gonna need the information from our original points here. So from this, I'm gonna drag out or get the instance transform with their instance index being the index of this for loop. And this is relative, so we don't need to check world space. What we could do is go ahead and split this struct pin, plug in the scale and rotation in directly. And for the location, I can go ahead and add here, let's say 200 units above on this end. Now it's not going to have anything here, so we can go ahead and specify what it is. So I can set static mesh and let's get ourselves a nice cone. So now I've hit compile. You can see 25% of these guys now have a cone right above them. So as you can see, it is very easy to actually start modifying this. As always, the project files for this are going to be available on my Patreon, where you can join these lovely people here in supporting what I do. It really helps helps me out. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments or join the Discord. Links are in the description down below as always. Thank you again to the patrons and let's get back to it. And you can also check if it is a specific type of mesh. So for example, for this guy here, what I'm doing is I'm getting all of the instances as before, and then I'm checking if the X location is greater than zero, if it's to the right of the world. And if it is, I spawn in a paired, and if not, I spawn in a cone. And this replaces the original cube mesh that I have in there. And afterwards, if the Y coordinate happens to be greater than zero, I'll go ahead and set the actual material to be something else. Now the animation graph is a little more complicated. For here, it's the same process though. I get all the instances of it. I get the transforms and I store them so I know where the original locations are. And then I go ahead and just simple true or false. It picks effectively this is a 50% chance instead of doing it through the integer 1 to 100, 50% input that way. This is just through a true or false, showing you a different way of doing it. And then in the event graph, I have a timeline. So timeline just goes up and down and it goes through and takes these components. Once again, it gets the original one. I only have cubes in this one, so I can just get zero. And then I get all the instances of it. And then for each one, I go ahead and grab their original location and I update that instances transform using the timeline. So when I do simulate, you could see it is going ahead and running it. Now, one thing to keep in mind on these guys, it is running here, but if I go ahead and just do a file, open the level and just reopen it and I don't save it and everything's here. If I hit simulate now, nothing happens. And you can see there's a lot of errors here. The reason for that is this post graph did not run because it only runs after it has finished constructing. So because it hasn't stored those variables that I'm using, it errors out. So you would need to on construction or on load, run this graph to just rebuild itself. And then you can go ahead and simulate and you have the same result. So just something to keep in mind that it's specifically after the graph has finished constructing, not just on load. But of course you can go ahead and force it to load on play and then everything can go from there. So with this functionality, you can do quite a lot of extra things you couldn't before. You can spawn things, you can grab things, you can even modify the points that are already there as you see. So if you wanted to, for example, you could have it where points in a certain area just get deleted because they're just instances. You can just delete them or you can add new ones and specify which shape it is and where they should be. So you have a lot of a lot of control. If you want to see another interesting way of using PCG, check out this video right here where I show you how to use it to create full landscapes.